So hello everyone, this is Jody King from the Alaska Apex Accelerator. Uh, we are just about ready to get started with our webinar to see if we can give it just another minute and hopefully we'll get that noon rush of everybody running from microwave to back to computer. Um, joining us today we have uh, Chris Pobieglo. I never say your I've known you how many years and I still can't say your name right, Chris. It's just Chris P. Yep, that's okay. <laughs> Uh, Chris P works. <laughs> I know there's L's and you can't say them and it's like oh my brain but a uh, lot of great information so uh, before we get started and I turn everything over let me just go over a few little housekeeping rules and that'll just kind of give everybody else a chance to get logged in so uh, welcome everyone Today's webinar is a business insurance market update. We're gonna talk about the industry changes that are happening now. Uh, Chris has a lot of great information. It's gonna be a fantastic webinar. For your information, believe it or not, even though you join us and are automatically muted, we really want you to ask questions and then take advantage of having the caliber presenter that we have today and his industry knowledge for the insurance market. Um, can't be beat. So while we have that expert here, feel free to ask questions. Now you can do that one of two ways. You can enter your question in the Q&A, or if you're just not in the mood to text or type, feel free to click the raise hand. I'll unmute you from this end. You get to unmute yourself. It's easier than it sounds. And then you can have that live mic. With that in mind, I uh, just want to let you know this webinar is being recorded. The recording will be posted on the apexalaska.org website under training events under on demand and it should probably be up by monday we usually just takes about 48 hours to get that posted so if you do have an open mic um, just be aware of it is being recorded uh, and what we'll do is we'll give some time for questions at the end too where i can turn the mic off as well so handouts the slides that you're about to see you can pull down from the handout section of the GoToWebinar panel if for any reason you're unable to download those handouts, you can either just reply to your webinar invitation and let me know. Um, I'll be happy to send that to you. Or when we do post the recording, the handouts will also be posted on our website and you'll be able to download from that spot as well. That's it for our onerous housekeeping rules. Oh, we got one more person. There we go. Looks like they're all signed in, ready to go. So at this point in time, I'd like to welcome Chris, uh, who, like I said, I can't tell you guys enough on his uh, insurance industry knowledge. So Chris, I'm gonna turn the mic over to you and then just let me know when you want me to advance the slides. So, sounds good, can you hear me okay, Jody? Yes, yeah, you're coming through pretty okay. clear. Okay, perfect. Well, I'll just first say thank you to Jody and Alaska Apex Accelerator for having me on to just kind of give a market update of what some of the property and casualty markets are doing out there. And why is that important to business owners? It's important because as a business owner, you obviously have to plan further out than this current year. What are you expecting in future years? What are your expenses going to be? what's going to be the availability of risk management transfer things like insurance coverages and things like that so it helps you have a better picture of what's coming up and that can be beneficial when you go to plan out some different things um, i've done a lot of seminars for formerly ptac but now alaska apex accelerator um, we we definitely support what they do over there. I encourage a lot of clients to go over there and talk to them when they're first getting started and or trying to grow or they have a need where um, there's something in government contracting and Alaska Apex has a lot of tools and resources available to try to help you with some of those things. Um, one of the things they have is they do these type of educational seminars I mean, I'll do one or two a year, but they have other people throughout the year. And so I encourage participation in those because it's really information for free that they're giving you to try to help help you along the way. Um, my name's Chris Pobiego. I've been a commercial insurance broker in Alaska for about 24 years now. 
Um, seen a lot of changes in that time. And uh, one, one thing I'll tell you is, um, Jody, go ahead and go to the next slide. Right, you know, right now it's probably uh, pretty well known that we're in a hard market and we have been for a few years. And so um, a hard market presents some challenges. And this hard market really came after about a 15 year run of a soft market. And so when you think about business owners, how many people have been in business for 20 years? You could have a lot of businesses that have been operating for 20 years out there that have never had a hard market before the last couple of years. They're used to a soft market. And um, go ahead and hit the next slide, Jody. And so what does a hard market mean? It means increased premium costs to business owners. It means your rates are going up 5 to 10% on a lot of lines of coverage consistently each year. And next slide, Jody. And it also means restricted underwriting, where you may not be able to obtain coverages that you had in the past, or may not be able to obtain them as easily through the same distribution channels or pricing. And so those are the two big factors that we see in a hard market. And those are both concerns for business owners. Um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the reason for some of the cost increase and the restricted underwriting. Um, you know, the number one driver is just your standard regular old inflation. When you think about your fuel, your material supplies, everything else in the world has gone up. You know, Washington, D.C. tells you there's a whatever it is, seven, eight percent inflation. But when you look at some of the real prices of what some of these things have gone up, it's gone through the roof. And so the property and casualty insurance isn't going to be any different. So your regular old inflation is driving a lot of the pricing. Um, there are some other factors in there that we'll talk about, but um, ultimately, you know, we're hoping that the market will soften a little bit as we go forward, but it's, it's still a pretty hard market. Um, uh, next slide, Jody. And here you can kind of see a little bit of what some of the U.S. property rates have uh, done in this market. Um, we'll talk a little bit about each individual line of coverage because some of them are performing differently. For example, your workers' comp coverage, that rate has dropped for like six years in a row. Um, when we look back six, seven years ago, Alaska was the highest rates in the nation for workers' comp. And then they did some stuff down in Juneau. They did some medical uh, fee refilings and some other things. And now they've brought that work comp rate down to where business owners in a lot of cases today are paying half the rate of what they were paying five or six years ago. Um, I remember when like residential carpentry used to run like $22 per hundred. Today it's 10 bucks. Commercial carpentry is like five bucks per hundred. And so your work comp rates have come down a lot. Eight years ago, when I talked to clients and I asked them the question, what is your pain point? Where, what, what's, what's the source of stress for you? Where are you having issues? They all invariably said workers comp. Nowadays, you don't hardly, I mean, you don't hear that conversation after six years of rates dropping. Now, work comp is probably about the only line of coverage that's been dropping. So if you're running a lot of payroll, you're probably seeing the, the savings and the difference in cost to your business for that. I think it's probably about bottomed out. I don't know how much lower workers comp can go. So we're hoping that it just kind of settles into a steady place where it's at now. That's a little bit of a relief for business owners who are paying much, much higher rates eight years ago on the work comp. And it also can help offset some of your other costs. Now, some of the lines of coverage that we've seen, uh, you can go to the next slide, Jody. Some of the lines of coverage we've seen that have really been hit by price increases and restricted coverages would be commercial property. Um, Right here is a graph that kind of shows you the percent increase of commercial property quarter over quarter. And it it's only goes up to 2023, but you can kind of see what it's doing there where you're having 
jumps from eight to 20 percent. So commercial property rates have just really gone up. And that's being driven by a couple things. One is, again, the markets and the inflation. Um, another thing that's being driven by is the increased replacement costs. Uh, if you have a building that five years ago you could have replaced for 400000 in today's market, that might be a six or $700,000 building. So you're just ensuring more value as well in these days. Um, commercial property is a really tough line, particularly here in Alaska. Um, if you own commercial property, there's some things that you should know and you should plan for. Uh, we've seen several insurance companies pull out of the Alaska marketplace for commercial property, so we've lost some availability. Um, another thing we've seen is insurance companies limiting their capacity on what they're willing to cover under just a commercial uh, property policy. So, for example, we had a $17 million building downtown Anchorage that we couldn't get a single property carrier who was willing to sign on to all 17 million of that. So we ended up having to layer the coverage with a primary of 10 million and then get a second carrier. Those carriers are looking to spread their risk. They're not wanting to sign up. And so in some cases there's been uh, restricted capacity. Um, in some cases you may not be able to get your preferred local carriers who have covered those in the past to cover them now. And so you may end up having to go into like surplus lines or take deep dives in the market to find coverage. And what I'll tell you is property, commercial property underwriters are being super selective about what they're wanting to write. There's, they have a pile on their desk and they're looking for best in class type business to write. And in Alaska, you have a ton of commercial property that was built in the 60s or 70s. And if there hasn't been appropriate maintenance and upgrades made to that property, you're going to find a hard time getting coverage. And if you do get coverage, it's probably going to be expensive. And it may be subpar coverage. It may not be the best property coverage that you can get. And so some of the things that they look at when they're looking at commercial property is they want to know about the upgrades on electric, heating, plumbing. And the number one thing is the roof, especially in this environment where we've had over 20 building roof collapses in the last two years. All the insurance carriers are asking questions about what the protocol is for removing snow loads off these buildings because they're all worried about it. And if you have a commercial property policy that's written on a basic coverage form, I can tell you that basic coverage excludes the collapse of roof from snow and ice. So you have an older building that hasn't been maintained, there's a fair chance your insurance carrier is only going to give you basic coverage. And if they do that, you do not have coverage for collapse of the roof from ice and snow. And so it's super important that if you own commercial property that you're taking care of those maintenance needs and replacing things as their shelf life runs out. Sometimes having inspections can be helpful to demonstrate to your insurance company that everything has been checked off and everything is upgraded. But I really want to emphasize this, that we're having a really challenging time with older properties, commercial properties that haven't been maintained. You're not finding insurance companies lining up to write those. So if you do own commercial property, it's important to keep this in mind that your rates are going up, the coverages are being restricted. Here in Alaska, we automatically have less choices than a lot of uh, people down, say, in California. There's a ton of insurance companies out there that you look them up and they write in the lower 48. Alaska has 800,000 people. That's just not enough people to get a lot of insurance companies excited. And so in a lot of cases, you know, you may have only a few options. And if you're presenting a building that has, you know, you deferred on maintenance, you're not upkeeping it, then that's uh, something to keep in mind. We'll go to the next slide, Jody. Uh, so this slide right here demonstrates what they call a combined ratio. And this is important because this is an indicator of whether insurance companies are making money or not. The blue line is your personal lines coverage, which we're not really talking about today. 
that's your homeowners, your personal auto, your personal umbrella. The yellow line is the commercial line, and that's where we're kind of focused on. You can see on the left side, 100%, okay? If an insurance company runs a 100% loss ratio, that means that they're paying out as much money in terms of claim settlements, attorney fees, and their claims adjusting expenses, all of their expenses, that's what they're putting out versus what they're taking in dollar for dollar. So if you've got a company running over a 100% loss ratio, they're putting out more money than their, than the, uh, in terms of expenses and stuff than what the premiums are that they're taking in. Nobody wants to see insurance companies running 100% loss ratios because obviously uh, they're in a for-profit business just like anybody else. And if they're not making a profit, they're going to make adjustments, they're going to tighten up. And so there's some considerations there. You can kind of see from this graph, it's kind of hovered around 100% for the better part of the last four or five years. Um, I know there's certain lines of coverage like commercial auto in Alaska that can be really challenging. The rates on the commercial auto for those of you listening who have commercial auto policies, as you know, have just kept ticking up every year, 8%, 8%, 10%, 5%. The rates on the auto have just been going up. And if you're in the type of business where you have a heavy auto exposure, then it's going to disproportionately affect how much insurance premiums you're paying. Um, you know, whereas the guy who has a big labor force is enjoying work comp savings, the guy who has a big fleet of vehicles is paying the price. And, you know, there's some things you can do on your end to try to help control those costs. Some of the things we've seen in this environment are people going with higher deductibles on their comp and collision. Maybe in the past they did 500 or 1,000. Now they're doing 2,000, 2,500. They're taking their older vehicles that are 15 years and older and don't have a lien holder, and they're pulling the comp and collision off of that and just basically self-insuring that and covering the liability. Um, so we're seeing some different things. If you have a seasonal business and you park your water trucks and your, your dirt trucks for the winter, then you should have your insurance take those off or suspend them. So there's some tweaks that we're seeing, and these are, these are quite common conversations with clients that we're having these days in this environment with this auto just continuing to spike up. Again, there's some options with commercial auto, but it, it's not a ton of options. I mean, probably most of your businesses in Alaska might have anywhere from uh, three to 10 insurance companies that will write them competitively. Um, usually when you can package it in with your other coverages, that can be beneficial in terms of saving costs and from an organizational point of view. But I think the last stat I saw for Alaska, the carriers were running about a 106% loss ratio, so they were paying out more. Why is that? Alaska has darkness, bad weather, bad roads. There's a portion of the population that's transitional, so every September when it snows, you've got a handful of people who are driving in the snow for the first time. And so there's a number of reasons why auto can be kind of tough in Alaska, but that's one of the tougher lines of coverage that we've seen, and the carriers are also taking a lot of losses in the auto department. Um, we'll go to the next slide, Jody. And so when we look at what the challenges are for the insurance companies, and this is important to understand just in the sense that this is partly what could be driving pricing. Most of them, or the, the most answered inflation is, is an issue. Um, like anyone else, their expenses have gone through the roof. Um, and they have some other things they list there, but the main one being that the inflation. Um, one other thing to understand about how the commercial insurance industry works is that these insurance companies have reinsurance companies. In other words, you know, when they write you a policy for $10 million and something goes sideways and they and the payout's needed, they don't want to absorb or assume all of that risk. They may assume a risk up to a certain level and pay the first $3 million, 
And then anything beyond that starts to go into their reinsurers. And so all of these insurance companies have relationships with reinsurers. And the last couple years, um, that's become tight for a lot of insurance companies. We know a couple companies operating in Alaska that had a challenging time with some of their reinsurance agreements. And that dictates their underwriting on some levels. If I have an agreement with a reinsurer that I won't write any commercial auto coverage for someone with a driver younger than 25, then that underwriter has to abide by what the reinsurance agreement says. I, as a broker, I can go to the underwriter and say all day long, well, I want you to cover this 24-year-old driver, but if he has a reinsurer agreement that dictates he can't, then he can't. I mean, so it's important to know that these reinsurance companies are in the background and they're, they're dictating um, in some cases what underwriting is doing and what coverages might be available. And that reinsurance market has gotten tough for some carriers in the last couple of years in terms of just availability and capacity. You have to have a lot of cash on hand if you're going to be a reinsurer. So um, just mentioning that, something to keep in mind. Uh, we'll go to the next slide, Jody. Okay. I have a question for you before we hop over to the next slide. Sure. So Tim wants to know, for commercial auto, if you are a summer-only seasonal business, is there a way to get that reduced risk reflected in your premium? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Obviously, here in Alaska, we deal with a lot of seasonal businesses. Um, now, there's a couple things that can be done about that. You know, we we can get the underwriter to just write you a seasonal policy from the get-go. You can put a policy in place for six months. If you know in May you need one through October, or if you need one through September, five months. We can go to the underwriter in, in most cases and write a short-term policy. Um, now, you may run into brokers who don't necessarily want to invest their time always into that model. Um, so that could be a decision made on a brokerage level that, okay, we don't want to write seasonal business. But as far as can it be done, yeah, and we do do it. Um, we have lots of guides and outfitters or people who only use that vehicle during the summer months. And we'll do it one of a couple different ways. Um, you know, there's a couple factors. I have one client who we write the commercial insurance on it from May till September. And then when September comes and they're no longer operating their business, they put like a state farm or an all state on it for the winter. They get a cheap personal lines coverage. Then come the spring, they cancel that policy and we write it back on commercial. It's the same vehicle. We're covered on commercial during the summer, State Farm or Allstate, whoever they use is writing it during the winter. So that's something that can be done and it should be done. You wouldn't want to pay uh, commercial premiums on vehicles that aren't being used or operated. Um, now there's a couple considerations. Some carriers, uh, well, if you have if you need to maintain an auto policy throughout the year because let's say you have 10 vehicles and nine of them are seasonal but you have one you use year round then that's no problem you either just pull the other vehicles off or some of the carriers will instead of removing the vehicle they'll just give it a suspended status where it's not incurring premium for you but it's still listed on the policy it depends a little bit whether or not you have like symbol one auto on the commercial side. Uh, I won't dive too deep into the auto symbols and the coverages, but the, the short answer is, yeah, you can do it. And there's different ways you can do it depending on the dynamics at play. The main thing is, is you just finding a broker and working with a broker who's willing to do it. Cause some of them may not want to mess with that kind of thing, but we do get a lot of seasonal business in Alaska and, so that that is a great question, and absolutely, Tim, you can you can pay auto for the period of time you use it. Now, one thing I will tell you is you're probably never going to find a broker who gets excited about you want to change things on and off every week. In other words, you want the vehicle covered one week, 
the next week you don't, the next week you do, the next week you don't, because in that case, you are probably going to run into some opposition from both an insurance company and a, and a, and a broker. But as far as seasonal and putting it on for, you know, three months at a time or six months at a time, absolutely. That's a good question. Um, yeah, if you guys have any questions, feel free to uh, drop them in the box or let Jody know. Um, at the end of the presentation is my email address. You're welcome to email me if you have any questions or anything I can provide clarity for. Um, this slide we're looking at now is another major reason for why insurance costs have gone up. And these kind of things will affect you in Alaska, even if we aren't directly impacted by the event. And so what I mean is when you have a hailstorm go through Colorado, and do, it does $50 million in damages to vehicles, that's a catastrophic loss. Uh, when you have a hurricane in Florida go through and destroy things, that's a catastrophic loss. When you have wildfires in California burning everything down, catastrophic loss. None of these events happened in Alaska, but every one of these events will affect what you pay in terms of insurance premiums in the future and now. Um, you know, the concept of insurance is to spread risk. And so you're going to have nine guys who pay insurance premiums and they don't have a claim that year. But you're going to have the one guy who does have a claim who then gets that claim covered by the premiums from the nine other people. And so the very act of insurance, you're transferring risk and uh, you're doing it by pooling it with lots of other premiums. There wouldn't be an insurance company in existence that only wrote your business. They have to write lots of businesses so they can spread and pool that premium. So these kind of catastrophic losses, you can kind of see what they've done where, um, you know, we used to have 24 million a year, 23 million a year, um, in, or uh, in losses, or sorry, billion, 24 billion, 23 billion. The last few years, 81 billion, 93 billion, 98 billion. And so the cost of these catastrophic disasters is only going up as well. And all of these are going to impact your insurance premiums on some levels. Uh, go to the next slide, Jody. So the hard market in Alaska, as I've talked about a little bit before, just looking at the, the lines of coverage that we mostly see being impacted. Um, your general liability is probably maybe ticked up a couple percentage points over year over year. Um, you know, your directors and officers liability may have ticked up. Professional liability on some industries has ticked up. But these are probably where we've seen the bulk of the premium increases, the bulk of the restrictive underwriting in the last couple of years are on these specific lines of coverage. I talked a little bit about the commercial property and uh, some of the challenges that we're having there. And again, you're seeing increased pricing, um, you're seeing restricted coverages. Um, underwriters are looking for best in class business. So, you know, if you own commercial property and, and the other piece of that too is, I mean, there's a lot of commercial property available for tenants. And so as a tenant, you know, I have choices for which building I'm going to lease in. And if it's one that's not being kept upgraded or maintained, that could impact my ability to have a tenant in there and generate rental income for myself. So there, there's a number of reasons why really upkeep on these commercial properties is at a, at a tipping point, really. If you have an older property and you aren't doing upgrades, you could find yourself unable to get coverage. We had a uh, a hotel uh, in Anchorage. Uh, I won't say much more than that because I don't want to identify it, but we, we submitted the hotel to the insurance markets and got declined by over 25 insurance companies and literally could not find anybody who would write a property policy on this $1.7 million hotel because some of the upgrades hadn't been done. They had had a prior claim. It just wasn't best in class business. The carrier, the underwriters looked at their Google reviews. And if you don't think those are important, trust me when I say that these underwriters are all looking at your website. 
They're all Googling information on you. We give them an application that tells them the information, but then they go out and do research and they're looking at, you know, all this stuff they can find. And if, if they find stuff that's adverse or um, problematic, they may just not want to write your, your building. Um, we did end up finally getting a property quote after about two months and a very deep dive in the market for that hotel. And the cost was astronomical. It was probably, I think it was, it was over 50,000 in premium for, for the year on something that if it was in good condition. They probably could have had it insured for, you know, 10,000 a year on the property. So paying five times the premium rate because nobody wants to write it. So commercial property, a huge factor. Uh, commercial auto continues to be a tough line of business. Um, I just encourage business owners to really look at their deductibles on all of their coverages, their auto, their property. You don't want to have a thousand dollar deductible in this environment. And you don't want to for a couple of reasons. One is you're going to pay more, a little bit more premium than if you take a higher deductible. But as your broker, I don't want you turning in thousand dollar claims. You know, if you get a twelve hundred dollar claim, I don't want you to turn that in because you start piecing together an adverse loss history, then you're going to have a hard time finding carriers who want to write this for you. And when they look at your claims history, they're looking at your frequency as much as they are, if not more, than your severity. If if I have a client who has one big claim, you know, in 20 years, it's kind of a one-off. It happens. That's why we have insurance. If I have a client that has four water claims, and even if they're small, they're $1,500 water claims, they have four of those in a year they're getting canceled. They're getting non-renewed because that's an ongoing issue and they should not have turned in these $1,200 claims. So really work with your broker and understand what is your threshold? How much skin are you willing to put into the game to have a little bit higher deductible? Um, not because we want you to pay more if there's a claim. I mean, that's what happens in the deductible, but because we really want you to think about you know, what piece of this can you self-insure and at what point do you turn in a claim? If you have a thousand dollar deductible on your vehicles and you have a, a cracked windshield, uh, turning in that claim when it's going to cost you 800 bucks to fix it makes no sense. So really understand where your deductibles are, what is your tolerance or threshold for accepting risk, and make your deductibles reflect that. Instead of a thousand dollar deductible, have a twenty five hundred dollar deductible. And then anything under twenty five, you're paying out of pocket, but you're also not reporting these little claims because they become a problem when you've reported these little claims, and now all of a sudden there's a big claim, and now you have a track record. You're getting non renewed, and I can tell you it's a pretty difficult thing to go out and replace coverage for somebody when they're being non-renewed and they have claims and they have open claims, you're going to pay a lot more in premium. Um, the final line of coverage I really wanted to talk about is excess liability. That would be like your commercial umbrella coverages, you know, your standard general liability, your standard auto liability, you're getting a million dollars in coverage through those. Um, what we're talking about is coverage above and beyond that. Typically, if you need more higher limits on your liability, you're putting a commercial umbrella in place. Um, this is often done when a business has grown or its assets have grown, its risk exposures have grown, and there's a greater chance of suit. Um, but it also can happen via a contract. We've had many clients who you never carry a commercial umbrella. Now you have a contract with the school district that requires you carry a $5 million umbrella. And so this excess liability has also been a challenge in this market. And what we're often having to do, depending on how much is needed, is again, layer that coverage. We might have one carrier who's willing to write the first two million, and then we got to get someone else who will write the next three million. So getting that excess liability coverage can be a challenge, especially in this environment. And where we see it really impacting things is with the transportation or it's sitting over the commercial auto. Um, 
you know, so you can have an excess liability policy or a commercial umbrella that all it does is sit over your general liability. It's just giving you more limits of your general liability. And that's typically a little bit easier to do than when you start building in the commercial auto. And especially in the transportation sector, if you're doing trucking or transportation, a million dollars uh, on a commercial auto policy may not be enough. If you kill someone, the average uh, the average lawsuit payout expense on that runs about three or four million, and so that's what you're looking at. So if you're trucking transportation, you have these big rigs on the road, you have more risk exposure. One of your big rigs hits a car, it's going to do more damage than just a car to car. So you may want to carry higher limits. You may have a little bit of a challenge at times finding adequate capacity or really that being limited. One of our local carriers used to do $5 million umbrellas all day on transportation. Today, they're limiting it to 2 million. So you're with them, we do the 2 million, now we gotta go find you 3 million through a second umbrella policy. So be aware of that, that excess liability, especially over auto and especially for the transportation sector is really uh, in a hard market. And And the main driver of that is you've had a huge increase in the amount of fatal and catastrophic losses when trucking companies and transportation companies are involved. Uh, the number of, you read about these claims in California where they go through the mountains and there's fog and then next thing you know, you got a 50 car pile up and you got these semi-trailer trucks plowing into people. Um, so really a tough segment, that's a hard market. Uh, Jody, we'll go to the next slide. So I have a quick question for you before we hop to the next slide. So you had given okay. an example that you have a general liability policy and then here comes a contract. You're looking at that solicitation and it's asking for a higher umbrella coverage than you might currently carry. So with the changes in today's industry, how long does it take to get that additional rider? Because yeah, no, that's a great question. Crosses, don't wait to the last second. So what's the time involved <laughs> if you do have to suddenly address your insurance policy for a upcoming solicitation? Well, I love that you brought that up. And one of my favorite things to go back to is, you know, planning is never a bad thing in business, no matter what you're doing. If you plan ahead and have adequate time, especially to me as a broker or your broker, that's going to often make a big difference, okay? Because what happens is, you know, we have clients who submit their contracts. We review the insurance and find out where the deficiencies are. That process is usually very quick, same day we're letting you know. Um, but if there are additional coverages required in there, you obviously need that information in order to be able to build that into your bid. And so a lot of what we do is provide cost estimates. If you come to me and you've got a bid in two days and you need a $5 million umbrella, I'm not gonna be able to get that quoted in two days. That's gonna take a week. If, but what I can tell you, and going back to doing this and being a broker for 20 plus years, from my experience is that, guess what, I've also, quoted umbrellas for you know 20 other clients in the last three months so i have a pretty good idea of about what the market's producing and pricing so i can come to you and go that's going to cost you four to six thousand a year i can give you an estimate so you can use that for purposes of your bid um, if you want an actual formal quote from an insurance company yeah you're looking at probably a week on, on well it depends let me say that it depends um, if it's something that a current carrier you're working with can provide, so let's say you have general liability with company X and you need an umbrella and company X will write that umbrella, that's usually maybe more of a few day process. If we have to go out to market and approach new carriers about writing an umbrella, then it could be a week, um, could be more. Um, it depends on how the markets are moving and sl sometimes they're slow, but that's a great question. I always just say, you know, give your broker as much advance notice as you can. Um, where we really have a tough time with it is when someone comes to us and says, you know, they call us at 10 a.m. and they have a 2 p.m. bid that they need 
you know, to know what to do with their insurance costs in there. Will we try to accommodate it? Yeah, every time, and we'll try to make it happen. But it's a lot better if you can allow your care, your broker to have some time. And here's one other piece to this. We have some insurance companies, they'll respond in one to three days. They may get you a quote in 24 hours, but is that the best quote? Is that the most competitive? Is it the best carrier for that client? Sometimes it's not. Sometimes the ones who come to you in a day or two are not. They don't underwrite it as heavily and they charge more. And so if you give me a week, I may be able to flush out a couple preferred markets that will be a bit more competitive on quotes, better coverage, a better situation for your business. But if you're giving me a day or two, you may have to go with whatever we can get in a day or two. So, and that goes for really any of your dealings with insurance and your broker or the insurance companies. The more time you can give them, the better, the better you can communicate with them and have that relationship, the better it's going to pay off for your business. Thanks, Chris. A lot of good information. All right, next you bet. slide. Yep, next slide. Uh, so I real quick wanted to go through through these because I really think these are super important. If you're listening to this broadcast, you probably are concerned maybe about how much insurance costs you're paying and some other things. And, and the insurance is an important piece of protecting your business. What we're doing with insurance is we're taking risks off the table for you. And we're doing that. We're taking these unknown risks and removing them for a, for a known premium. So we're putting a price on something that otherwise might be an unknown. And so insurance has a valuable role to play for businesses. I know the tendency a lot of times is to think, you know, boy, I've had 20 years and no claims and I've been paying all these premiums and, you know, nobody's going to celebrate that. I mean, I, you know, I think most people like insurance sometimes seems like a tough deal when you're paying premiums. And trust me, like for my brokerage, I pay a ton of premium for my own insurance coverages. So I get that. I get having to do a budget and build this stuff in. But it's managing risk is an important piece of it. And so I was going to go ahead and just run through real quick some of the basic tenets of risk management as a reminder as we kind of wind down, because these are valuable things. Next slide, Jody. Never risk more than you can afford to lose. That sounds self-evident but be conscious of taking risks that could completely sink your business if they don't go according to plan. Next slide. Just a comment on number one too, is make sure you understand what the real cost of that potential risk is for replacement too. So if we're using old costs in our head because this is what we paid for it, then uh, know what the real cost is before you decide what your risk is. Sorry, I had to throw that in there. Let me give you your next slide, Chris. No, that, that, that's so good. I, I love that because this, the thing about it is, is what I see a lot of times is when a business struggles and has struggles with insurance premiums, it's because they're not charging enough for their goods and services. They're, they may be basing their overhead and you know all of these extra expenses and costs based, like you said, on prior data that's not accurate or you know, maybe they're being forced to have, deliver their goods and services at a certain price point in order to meet the market, but that price point doesn't jive with all their other expenses and costs. Because realistically, if you're allocating and doing job costing and putting all these insurance expenses into your cost, you're not even paying your insurance expenses. Your customers are paying your insurance. You just have to accurately know what it is and know what to charge and build in. And so, yeah, that's important. Um, number two is don't risk a lot for little gain. Uh, again, you know, don't take big chances if there isn't a good chance of reward. You know, you have to take risks. And in order to capitalize on opportunities, every one of us take risks. And sometimes those are unsettling. But just make sure you're not risking too much when there's not a good enough payoff on the other end for you. Number three, next. Uh, risk identification is the more, most important step of managing risk. So you can do a lot of things with risk. You can identify it. You can analyze it. You can uh, 
you know, put, put policies and procedures and do things in place. But the number one most important thing is to identify the risk, because if you don't identify it, you have no ability to develop strategies and controls in place to help you manage this risk or figure out how you're doing it. We call it the passive retention of risk when a business owner is basically self-insuring a risk and they don't know about it. That's a dangerous situation. And so we want business owners to focus their risk management efforts on identifying risk, uncovering it. There's a lot of different ways you can do that. Um, I have a whole 10 step thing of different tools and resources on what you should do, but just ticking a couple off real quick, you know, review your contracts. Your contracts are full of risk. Understand what's in there, review your contracts. Premise inspections, site inspections. You can utilize third party uh, HR consultants, safety people. So there's a lot of different tools you can use to help uncover these risks. It's just a matter of sitting down and coming up with a formalized process to do that. Uh, next slide. Number four, risk is not always self evident. Uh, you know, some are, some aren't. That's pretty self explanatory. Next slide. Uh, no such thing as an uninsured loss. So if you have insurance and the insurance company covers your claim, they're covering your claim. If you either don't have insurance or you have insurance but it excluded whatever happened in your claim, then you become the de facto insurance company. We always say there's no such thing as an uninsured loss. People like to use that term, I don't. It's, it's going to be covered by somebody. It's either going to be covered by the insurance company or by you as the business owner. And so there's no such thing as an uninsured loss. Next slide. Consider the likelihood of events and the impact. That means sit down and once you've identified these risks, understand what is the likelihood of something happening. If you have a, a thing of ice right in front of your front door, what's the likelihood somebody's going to slip and fall and hurt themselves on that? It's probably pretty high. Um, you know, if you're worried about a meteor going through the roof of your building, probably pretty low. So just understand that once you do identify risk, you also have to factor in what is the potential of these things happening. And if they do, what's the impact of that? Next slide. Risk is present in every business activity. That could be from digging a ditch to selling a cannoli to sending your secretary to the store to get new staples, to opening your front door, to having a sale, to signing a contract, to signing a lease. All of these things have risk. It's present in every single business activity and you have to be active in managing that. Next slide. A combination of different risk identification methods should be used. So that means basically just using more than, utilizing multiple tools to uncover risk. Next slide. Uh, don't treat insurance as a substitute for risk control. And so basically that just means just because you have insurance doesn't mean that you don't need to do anything. My example would be workers' comp. Okay, you have workers' comp, it's gonna pay medical expenses and lost time for any of your injured employees. But there's gonna be um, you know, things that can be adverse to you as the business owner, even if it is covered. You're still losing a person from your workforce. So is it worth it to have a weekly safety meeting where these people are trained and can potentially avoid getting hurt? Um, and so, you know, just because you have insurance doesn't mean you still shouldn't manage risk. You have deductibles you're going to pay. I mean, nobody wins when there's an insurance claim, certainly not the owner. Even if that claim is covered, in most cases you still have deductible, lost time, lost assets. There's a lot of reasons why it's still smart to manage risk, even if you have insurance coverage. Next slide. Uh, risk is subject to diagnosis and treatment. It just means that, you know, risk is there and there are solutions for managing that risk. Um, again, there's my email address at the bottom of the screen, chris at businessinsuranceassociates.com. If you want a copy of the top 10 ways to identify risk, shoot me an email, I'll send it over to you. Or if you have any other questions about this presentation, um, let's see, how are we doing on time, Jody? We've got about 10 minutes. Okay, perfect. Uh, next slide. It's also important as a business owner that 
you understand the legal environment that we're operating in. Next slide. Um, courts and juries are often tilted in favor of the injured party in lawsuits versus property or business owners. Um, I think the last stat I saw said that business owners lose 70% of their cases that go to court when it involves the employee or former employee um, or another injured party. So keep that in mind that these court resolutions aren't always just. Um, uh, you could be subject to the whims of a particular judge or a jury. You don't know how some of these things are going to play out, but just know that in general, if you go into litigation as an employer, you could be at a disadvantage from the get-go. Next slide. There is an entire industry dedicated towards suing you. Um, you'll see these commercials on television and on radio, and they run and they talk about, have you been injured or, you know, did you drink the water here or did you work in the shipping industry or, you know, all of these different things where essentially you have attorneys who put together lawsuits and then go find the people who can join into those. And so be aware there is an entire industry of plaintiff attorneys out there who love to sue businesses. That's how they make their money. That's how they send their kids to college is suing businesses. Um, if you ever stay home during the day, and I rarely do this, but if you're ever home during the daytime, you'll see on regular TV, there's a bunch of these commercials. And it's because they're targeting injured workers who are out of the workforce. They're home during the day, injured and recovering. And now they got 10 different commercials telling them that they have a grievance against you. So be aware of that. Next slide. Uh, again, there's, you know, free online coaching to help people pursue claims against businesses. Next slide. There you go. Hello, I am suing you. Um, this is going to kind of wind down the end of the presentation. I really just wanted to touch a little bit real quick on risk management, the importance of that, and the importance of understanding the legal environment at the same time, giving you guys an update on the property casualty markets and some of the challenges there. Um, you, you know, it, it's a hard market. You're going to see increased pricing. You're going to see restricted coverage. It's important to work with your broker, give them adequate time, give them good information. If you have a commercial property, make sure you're doing that deferred maintenance and replacing those building systems as they need to be replaced. Um, and uh, yeah, otherwise open for questions or if anybody's welcome to email me later. Uh, thank you, Jody. Always appreciate everything you guys do over there at Apex and uh, happy to join you today. Thanks. So absolutely, anybody have any questions? Because if you're thinking, no, oh, this is really good general business impact and information for just running your business, all of these things that Chris talked about today are going to have that cost impact for your government contract as well. And so if you're looking at being awarded a five-year contract where you've got that base year plus all these option years and you're forward estimating your costs for these option years, here's some things to think about for this future cost. If this is one aspect of the cost of doing business and we have an expert telling us, hey, pay attention to this, higher premiums or reduced coverage or challenges and options, these are absolutely things that we want to take a look at um, and make sure that we're prepared moving forward, not just for future contracts, but for existing contracts as well. So we'll give you a minute to think if you last chance for questions. And just as a reminder, uh, Chris, we love that you are so willing to present to us today. And I truly appreciate the information. There was a lot of good things to really think about uh, and, and looking at, especially for that commercial property. Because even though the commercial property might not be a direct cost component in any of your contracts, it's definitely impacting your overhead and making sure that you're covered in that when you're building your price components. So yeah, absolutely, all of that does have an impact on that potential for whether you're profitable for your government contracts. So just as a reminder, since we have a couple minutes left, um, 
Wask Apex. We're one of 94 across the US, Puerto Rico and Guam. I got to meet someone from Puerto Rico uh, last week at our spring conference. Amazing folks. Uh, but there's a lot of opportunity. So don't forget if you're thinking of diversifying by looking at different geographic regions, well, gosh, now one, you have a new business insurance person you can talk to about looking at the cost of diversifying from a risk management standpoint and your liability impact. But also you can reach out to other resources such as the uh, National Association of Apex Accelerators, the website A APTAC, it's still our old name, they're slowly moving that over to NAPEX, but this link still gets you there. And also the DOD website of apexaccelerator.us and you can see a listing of other APEX locations across the US. And one of the things that Chris was talking about is those risk management components so this time I'm gonna do a shout out to the Small Business Development Center as well and their national association. So you can reach out to, if you're looking at some of your cost factors and discussing risk management and are looking for a business advisor uh, to kind of help get you started, not only do you have Chris and uh, your current insurance broker, but there is the Alaska Small Business Development Center as well. And they have a national association under America's SBDC. So it's Possess of America's sbdc.org. So lots of great resources for you. Make sure that you guys are running at your absolute fiscal best. Chris, any last minute closing comments? Well, here, here's what I'll tell you. The last two years as a commercial insurance broker risk management professional have been the most challenging years of my career. Um, I'm not going to clients going, here's your renewal, your price has gone down. That's what we were accustomed to doing for 12, 13 years. And in this environment, that's not happening. And we're finding more and more challenges trying to place coverages for clients just with the state of the market. You know, we have access to a couple hundred insurance companies, but um, you know, a lot of times when you start digging down into niche things, you may actually only have one, two, maybe three. I mean, so yeah, it's it's really a challenging time. And I just encourage everyone to have good communication with their broker to help navigate through this. So it sounds like it's one of those things, don't assume what you've done before is always going to be there when it comes to your insurance. You might have a surprise around the corner at your next re renewal point. Yep, nobody likes surprises. Not the kind that costs you more. <laughs> it's good to hear about the workman's right. comp though. That's good to hear that that is uh, dropping. Yeah. Well, everyone, this is the last call for questions. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and do our formal goodbye and then I'm gonna stop the recording. So if anybody did have a question, they just didn't wanna capture it on the recording. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Chris, thank you so much for your time and effort of putting this information together. And just to give you guys a heads up, Chris is gonna be back for us in April, on April 9th. Let's see if I can remember my calendar. Yep, April 9th, we're gonna do a surety bond, um, kind of a surety 101. So if you're looking for more information or updates or expanding, growing, or you're looking at diversifying into a market where you need that surety bonding, um, be sure to sign up for that webinar. Again, it's free. That's on April 9th. And I believe that's also from noon to one. All right.